Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, we're going to be covering everything PEDS, important PEDS concepts to know for your PEDS final, midterm, HESI, ATI, NCLEX. So I'm gonna be covering important PEDS concepts, and there are too many concepts for me to cover in just one video. So I'm going to span it out over a couple of couple videos, okay? If you haven't done so already, you know what to do. If you wanna support this channel, please be sure to like and more importantly to subscribe below um go ahead put something in the comment section if there is a subject that you'd like to see me cover so without any further ado let's get to our first question number one a two-year-old child recently diagnosed with hemophilia a is discharged home what information should the nurse include in a teaching plan about home care a Minimize interactive play with other children to lessen chances for injury. B, give low-dose children's chewable aspirin in orange flavor for joint discomfort. C, use firm and dry toothbrush to clean teeth at least twice per day. Or D, apply pressure and ice for bleeding while elevating and resting the extremity. If you're new to my channel, guys, I know I can I can go kind of fast. If you need to, if you need it to be at a slower pace, excuse me, all you have to do is press the pause button. Go ahead, read the question, look at your choices, and when you you think you know the answer, go ahead and press play, and I'll go over the answer and rationale. So for this question, the correct answer is D. Apply pressure and ice for bleeding while elevating the extremity. So guys, hemophilia A, this is a bleeding disorder, right? Um, with hemophilia A, important things you ha guys have to know about this bleeding disorder. You have to know that it's X-linked, okay? And you have to know that it's a bleeding disorder. So patients with hemophilia A, they're not gonna be doing contact sports, okay? They're not gonna do anything where they can um, be injured and they can possibly hemorrhage to death, right? So if they want to play a sport, it can't be contact. It can't be basketball. It can't be soccer. It needs to be something like golf, chest, something where they're doing by themselves and they don't have to worry about being injured by someone else because it's a bleeding disorder. So D is the correct answer. You want to apply pressure. What does pressure do? D pressure stops bleeding and, of course, Ice and rest, R-I-C-E, rest, ice, compression, that's the pressure, and elevation, all right? So that's what you want to do for that patient who has hemophilia A. Let's go through the other choices because I also want you to know why the wrong answers are wrong. A, minimize interactive play with other children to lessen chances for injury. Well, guys, I say this all the time in pediatrics. The work of the child is play. That's how they learn about their environment. That's how they learn social interaction. So you should not take that away from a child. Yes, you wanna keep them safe from injury, but there are lots of things that they can do with other children where they will not be injured. So A is incorrect. B, give low dose children's chewable aspirin. Absolutely not. What do you think that's gonna to do to that child with hemophilia? It's gonna make the bleeding worse. No. C, you, oh, by the way, guys, it's a child, so we're not trying to give them aspirin anyway because we can give them what? Ray syndrome. So that's out of the um, equation. Then you have C, use a firm and dry toothbrush to clean their teeth at least twice a day. Cleaning their teeth twice a day, that's wonderful. But look at the first part of that answer. Using a firm and dry toothbrush, uh, no. That's gonna cause trauma to the gum line and the patient may what? Bleed. The problem is that they already have a, this bleeding disorder. We're not trying to make it uh, worse. So the correct answer is D. Next question. A two-year-old child with Down syndrome is brought to the clinic for his regular physical exam. The nurse knows that which problem is frequently associated with Down syndrome? A, congenital heart disease. B, fragile X chromosome, C, trisomy 13, or D, pyloric stenosis? And the correct answer is congenital heart disease, the most common complication of Down syndrome that, um, of Down syndrome that children have is congenital heart disease. They're born with certain um, heart defects or anomalies. 
Now look at um, our other choices. You have B, fragile X chromosome. This is, that's actually a sex linked abnormality. Then you have a C, trisomy 13. Well, Down syndrome is actually the trisomy 21. So that one's wrong. And then you have pyloric stenosis. That's a GI disorder, it has nothing to do with Down syndrome. So the correct answer is A. Next question. A two-year-old child diagnosed with GERD has developed a fear of eating. What instructions should the nurse include in the parent's teaching plan? A, other, excuse me, invite other children home to share meals. B, accept that he will eat when he's hungry. C, reward the child with a nap after eating. Or D, consistently follow a set mealtime routine. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is D, okay? Consistently follow a set mealtime routine. And I'm going to explain that to you. Let's go through our other choice. Well, no, let me tell you why the correct answer is the correct answer first. So we're dealing with what? A two-year-old. What stage is that two-year-old in? Toddler. One to three, they're toddlers, right? At that stage, they find security. They find safety. They find comfort in routine. That's why if you go to a daycare center, you will see they do the same thing day in, day out. They follow the same routine. Why? At that age, that's what the children find comfort in. They freak out if you change their routine, even a little bit, okay? They find safety, security, comfort in having a set routine. So let's look at our other choices. You have A, invite other children home to share meals. There are only two. At two year old, at um, two year, years old, they don't find comfort in um, being with other children. Now they don't mind parallel play. They'll play with their own toy next to another child playing with their own toy, but it's not interactive. They're not playing with each other. They don't find any joy, any comfort in that. Okay, so that's why A is incorrect because it's a two-year-old, right? They're still interested in par parallel play. Then you have B, accept that he will eat when he's hungry, especially a toddler. If you wait to feed a toddler when they're hungry, they might starve to death. Why? Another thing about toddlers, they're establishing their independence. You ever heard of the terrible twos? Everything is no, no, no. Anything you say to that child, they're saying no because they're establishing their independence. And sometimes they may be hungry, but because they want to establish their independence, they'll say no, right? So you don't wait until the toddler's hungry to feed them. They need to eat consistently at a consistent time and routinely. Three, <laughs> reward the child with a nap after eating. That is not a reward for a toddler. They never want to take a nap. To them, a nap is punishment. So that's incorrect. So your correct answer is D, consistently following a mealtime routine and a set routine, okay? Next question. A two-year-old child with trisomy 21, that's the Down syndrome, is brought to the clinic for a routine evaluation. Which assessment findings suggest presence of a common complication often experienced by those with Down syndrome? A, presence of a systolic murmur. B, a new onset of patchy alopecia. C, complaints of long bone pain. Or D, recent projectile vomiting. And I'm not even gonna give you guys a moment to think of the answer because I kind of gave it to you a couple questions ago when I told you those patients who have Down syndrome, the most common complication that you'll see with that are congenital heart defects. So that correct answer is A, the presence of a systolic murmur. Is a heart murmur normal? No. All right, next question. A three-month-old infant develops oral thrush. What pharmacologic agent should the nurse plan to administer for treatment of this disorder? A, nystatin, B, nitrofurantin, C, norfloxacin, or D, neomycin sulfate? And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is A, nystatin. That's your mycostatin. So what is oral thrush, guys? It's a fungal infection in the mouth. 
right? So you're going to give the patient an antifungal medication, and nystatin is an antifungal medication. You see choice B, C, and D, all of those are antibiotics, okay? So an antifungal, let me back up. An antibiotic is not going to do anything for antifungal. An antifungal isn't going to do anything for antibiotic, okay? You need to treat accordingly. So when you see that word thrush, I want you to make sure, I want to make sure that you understand that that's a fungal infection. And most of not only children, peds, but adults as well, when they get thrush, oral candiasis, right? What many um, times what happens is they're taking oral antibiotics. And what happens is those antibiotics, and not only oral, systemic as well, the antibiotics kill the normal flora of the mouth. And so when the normal flora of the mouth die, they're gone, it's a perfect breeding ground for fungus to grow, okay? And that's when the patient develops the thrush, which is that white, patchy-looking, um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Not sheet, but layer that you'll see around their mouth in the oral mucosa. So you're gonna give them an antifungal agent for that. A four-year-old boy was admitted to the emergency room with a fractured right ulna and a short arm cast is applied. When preparing the parents to take the child home, which discharge instruction has the highest priority? A. Call the healthcare provider immediately if his nail beds appear blue. B, check his fingers hourly for the first 48 hours to see if he's able to move them without pain. C, be sure his arm remains above his heart for the first 24 hours. D, take his temperature every four hours for the next two days and call if an elevation is noted. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is A, call the doctor immediately if the nail beds appear blue, okay? If the nail beds appear blue, what does that mean? That means the patient's not getting circulation to that lower extremity, okay? And if that happens long enough, they may lose that extremity, okay? What, why are you constantly doing these checks? You're watching out for what compartment syndrome? Okay, you're going to be doing checking all those P's. Pulse, you want to check the pulse di distal to the site. Paralysis, make sure they can feel that um, extremity. Poiku, I can never pronounce this word, poikothermal something. But basically, that's the temperature. You want to te check their temperature because if they're getting um, circulation, their skin should be nice and warm right? Because it's the blood that makes it warm. So it should be nice and warm. What's my other P? Pallor. Watch out for pallor. You want to know what gives the skin the pink color? The blood. So if that skin is white, you think they got blood flow? No, you're going to watch out for pallor. So what I, what I have, I have pulse, poikythermal, whatever that word is, which is temperature, pallor, Paralysis, can they move it? What are my other P's? I have six P's and I can't think today. Pain, do they have pain in that area? Pallor, pulse, poiki, the temperature. Pallor, pulse, temperature, pain, paralysis. Paresthesias, that's my sixth one, my sixth piece. So do they have that little, um, uh, um, prickly feeling. Okay. And let me tell you something. Whenever a patient has a cast, right. And then they say, you know, I'm having a funny feeling. Sometimes they'll describe it as a funny feeling. You better run to that patient and you better check those six P's immediately. Because let me tell you something. If a patient ends up getting compartment syndrome, decreased circulation to the point that the tissues in that area don't get enough blood supply, which means they're not getting enough oxygen, which means those tissues starts to start to die off. And that patient has to get that extremity um, amputated. That's your fault. That's a bad nursing because you should have caught it a long time ago. Okay. So any patient that is in um, a cast or anything that can possibly compress that area, you're going to be checking for those six P's constantly. 
So the other choices of B, C, and D, those are great choices. You want to do all of them, but what takes priority is A, why that patient can lose that limb if you're not vigilant. A five-month-old is admitted to the hospital with vomiting and diarrhea. The pediatrician prescribes dextrose 5% and 0.25 normal saline with two MEQs of potassium chloride, chlo potassium chloride 100 mLs to be infused at 25 mLs per hour. Prior to initiating the infusion, the nurse should obtain which assessment finding? A, frequency of emesis in the last eight hours. B, B when is serum creatinine. C, current blood sugar level or D, appearance of the stool? And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is B, B when in creatinine levels. Now guys, they threw all those numbers in there just to make you nervous, to get you scared. Guess what? All we cared about was that patient was getting potassium. Let me make this clear. Whether if it's a child or an adult, anybody, if they're getting potassium, before you give that potassium, you better check that BUN and creatinine. Why? Potassium has such a narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. That's it, okay? Anything outside of that range can put the patient at risk for dysrhythmias, okay? So imagine the doctor orders potassium. You didn't check that BUN and creatinine. You gave the potassium, not knowing that the kidney function is down and that patient's unable to get rid of the potassium through the urine. So now the pota patient's potassium has jumped up to five. Patient gets a cardiac dysrhythmia. Want to know whose fault that is? Your fault. Your license that is at risk. Why? You should have checked that BUN and creatinine. You do not give potassium until you make sure that that BUN and creatinine is within normal range. Because if that BUN and creatinine is up, that lets you know that the kidney function is down. That means you do not give the potassium and you make a phone call to the provider. You say, hey, I noticed you want me to give potassium, but this is the patient's BUN and creatinine. Are you sure you still want me to give it? And if the doctor says yes, you tell them come give it themselves because you are not losing your license. And let me tell you something, when you know your stuff the way you're supposed to know your stuff, you can be bold that way. And the healthcare providers, the other nurses, they respect you because you know your stuff. Okay? When you know your stuff, you won't be, be afraid to call the doctor. All right. Potassium. You better check the BUN and creatinine, and it better be within normal range before you give it. Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, next question. A six-month-old infant is admitted to the PACU with elbow restraints in place. He has an endotracheal tube and is ventilator dependent, but will be extubated too soon following recovery from anesthesia. Which nursing intervention should be included in the child's plan of care? A, keep restraints on at all times to prevent unplanned extubation. B, remove restraints one at a time and provide range of motion exercises. C, remove all restraints simultaneously and provide play activities. D, document the reason for application of the restraints every 72 hours. Okay, guys, the correct answer is B. You're going to remove those restraints only one at a time, and you're gonna do it one at a time. You're gonna provide range of motion exercises before you put it back on. And that's very important, guys. What you don't want the patient to do is to develop contractures. All of the other answers are just flat out incorrect. A six month old is admitted to the PEDS unit after falling off of a bike. Which intervention should the nurse implement to assist the child's adjustment to hospitalization? A, explain hospital schedules to the child, such as mealtimes. B, use terms such as honey and deer to show a caring attitude. C, provide a list of rules that limit visitation to siblings in the hospital. Or D, 
orient the parents to the hospital unit and refreshment areas. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So the correct answer is A, guys. You want to explain hospital schedules to the child, such as mealtimes. Look at the age. Six is considered what? A school age child, right? And just like um, set routines was comforting to the toddler, explanations is comforting to the school age child. So what you're gonna do preferably if you can before that child is, let me go back to the question. Okay, so before, um, if you can, if it's possible, you give them an orientation, you tell the child what to expect, things they might see, things they might hear, things they might, might smell, okay? You're gonna keep it in very concrete terms because they're only six years old. But the school age child is learning and just the fact that they know what to expect, that they know what to anticipate, it decreases their anxiety. Okay, that is comforting to them. It gives them a sense of security. So it's very important when you guys get these peace questions, the age is very important because the age lets you know what level their cognition is on. Okay, look, let's go over the other choices so I can explain to you why they're wrong. You have B use terms such as honey and deer. You do not use those terms for patients. I don't care if it's peds or adult. You never call them honey or dear or sweetheart or mama or boo. No. If it's an adult, you call them by Mr. or Mrs. unless they give you permission to call them by their first name. And if it's a child, you call them by their first name, but you do not call them by those uh, familiarities. Uh, what was choice C? provide a list of rules, guess what that's going to do? That's going to increase their anxiety. That's going to make them more fearful and nervous. And choice D, orient the parents to the hospital unit. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. But guess what? If you had to choose between orienting the parents and explaining things to that child that's school age, what are you going to choose? That child, that is your patient. Okay, reorienting those patients, that the, orienting the parents, that comes secondary to your patient. You're going to orient your patient because they're old enough to really understand what you're telling them in very concrete terms. They're not going to go in very detail and get technical because if you do that, then you're going to make them scared. Then you're going to make them nervous. But just giving them the basics, that's actually going to um, relieve their anxiety. Okay. Next question. A seven month old infant with rotavirus causing severe dehydration is admitted for treatment. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? A, obtain a scale to weigh the infant's diapers. B, instruct the mother to offer Pedialyte regularly. C, insert IV line and begin IV fluids. Or D, obtain a stool specimen for analysis. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Now guys, all of these are great choices. These are all great interventions, but when it comes to nursing, it's always what? The best of the best, right? So the number one thing before you do anything else is rehydration. It's gonna be C, you're gonna give them IV fluids. I want you to think about it. Let me go back. So it's a seven month old. This is an infant. You know how tiny their bodies are? The smaller that the patient is, the more at risk they are for dehydration right? As adults, our body will compensate. So we can go into dehydration, but it takes a lot more for us to go into dehydration. But in peds, the smaller they are, the faster that they'll bottom out on you, the faster that they'll go into dehydration. You don't have that much time to correct the issue. So this patient who, it says they have a rotavirus. So the minute you saw a rotavirus, you should have been thinking of diarrhea. And then they backed it up. If you didn't catch it by the rotavirus, Look at what they said. They didn't only say diarrhea. They said what? Severe diarrhea. What did I tell you about that word severe? Didn't I tell you when you see that word severe, you're like, oh. this is important, right? Because anything severe is going to affect their physiologic integrity. So severe diarrhea, what are we worried about? Dehydration. 
They're losing all their fluids, which where they're losing their fluids out the butt, but they're still losing it, right? So the first thing you want to do is rehydrate the patient. So A, B, C, D, all of them great um, choices. But the first thing you care about is correcting the problem. And that's by rehydration, rehydrating the patient. Next question. A 12-month-old boy is admitted with a respiratory infection and possible pneumonia. He's placed in a mist tent with oxygen. Which nursing intervention has the greatest priority for this infant? A, give small frequent feedings of fluids. B, accurately chart observations regarding breast sounds. C, have bulb syringe readily available to remove secretions. D, encourage older siblings to visit. And guys, again, all of these choices are great choices. All of these choices are nursing interventions that you're gonna do for your patient. But what's most important? What takes priority? What's critical? And it's C, because who cares about anything else if your patient's not breathing? What's going on with our patient? They have a respiratory infection. That's an infection in the lungs, possible pneumonia. So you better make sure you have something to remove those secretions because if that patient can't breathe, does any of our other interventions matter? None of them matter. Airway, 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 okay? So although um, A, B, C, and D are all nursing interventions that we're gonna do, the very first one that takes priority is airway, making sure that they have a clear airway so that they can breathe. A 14-year-old female client tells the nurse that she's concerned about the acne she has recently developed. Which recommendation should the nurse provide? A, remove all blackheads and follow with an alcohol scrub. B, use medicated cosmetics only to help hide the blemishes. C, wash the hair and skin frequently with soap and hot water. Or D, encourage her to see a dermatologist as soon as possible. And the correct answer is C, wash hair and skin frequently with soap and hot water. Why? Because you're making sure that there's no um, oil on that skin that will do what? Clog the pores. When the pores are clogged, what happens? You get pimples right? So that's what you're going to teach the patient. That's important. And the reason, not only skin, but also the hair, because you have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The sebaceous glands, right? So you have oil that is produced not only on the skin, but on your scalp as well. And guess what it does? It's easy for it to come down to the face. So you're gonna teach them to make sure they wash their hair and the face to make sure that those uh, pores don't get clogged so they don't get acne or the acne doesn't worsen. So let's look at our other choices. Look at A, remove all blackheads and follow with an alcohol scrub. That is too traumatic to the skin, that's too harsh. Okay, that's too harsh to skin. It could cause trauma. And guess what? That trauma may cause a secondary infection on the patient's skin. So you're not going to do that. C, use, look how they tried to trick you. They put that word medicated. We don't care if it's medicated or not. Guess what cosmetics do? They cl um, clog the pores, which cause what? Acne. So I don't care if they put that word medicate in front of it. If it's a cosmetic, it's going to clog the pores. So you're never going to suggest to the patient who's complaining about pimples, acne, to go ahead and put cosmetics to cover up the problem. And then you have choice D, encourage her to see a dermatologist. First of all, that referral is going to come from the doctor. After the doctor's tried everything, the doctor's going to be the one to say, okay, you need to see this specialist. You need to see that specialist, not you, the nurse. Okay. And we are down to our last question. A 15 year old girl tells the school nurse that all of her friends have started the periods and she feels abnormal because she has not. Which response is best for the nurse to provide? A, refer the adolescent to the healthcare provider for a pregnancy screen. B, schedule a conference with her parents to recommend hormone therapy. 
C. Explain that menarche varies and occurs between the ages of 12 and 18. Or D. Suggest that she use diversions to help her not worry, worry about delayed menarche. And the correct answer is C. You know, girls usually get their periods between 12 and 18, so you let um, that patient know that, okay? You have to educate them. Let's look at our other choices, guys. A. <laughs> Refer the adolescent to the healthcare provider for a pregnancy screen. How's she going to be pregnant and she's never had her period before? We're getting rid of that question. B. Schedule a conference with her parents to recommend hormone therapy. Guess what? You wouldn't be the one recommending that. The physician would. Okay? Number one, the physician would be recommending that. And number two, that's not even necessary because that child is still within that window period for her to get her period. And then D. Do we ever tell patients not to worry? Never. You never tell patients, don't worry. You never say to patients, what made you? You never ask patients why. Those are huge no-nos. Okay, you address their issue. You don't tell them not to worry about it. You address it. Okay, and so that's why C is the correct answer because you're empowering that patient with the education that they need. Guys, I hope this was helpful. I promise I have at least... Three more videos I'm going to be sending you away on peds, and I'm also going to be uh, sending you guys some OB videos, um, maternity videos as well. I hope uh, this was helpful to you. Again, guys, to support this channel, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe. Share this video with any friends, any classmates that you know would benefit from these videos. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you guys next time.